Wound infections may be classified according to the source of the bacteria responsible into self-infections and cross-infections. In this diagram, the sources of self-infection are shown on the left. They are the nose and throat and skin and clothing of the patient himself. The sources of cross-infection are shown on the right. The infected wounds of other patients and the hands, instruments, nose and throat of the nurses and doctor. The bacteria may be transferred to the wound directly by contact with fingers, instruments and so forth, or by droplets sprayed from the mouth, or they may first contaminate the air or dust, which then infects the wound. The risk of infection by direct transfer is great with all sorts of wounds, but the risk of airborne infection varies according to the size of the wound and the length of time for which it is exposed. For small wounds which do not take long to dress, the risk of airborne infection is not very great and it's justifiable to limit the precautions against it to providing good ventilation and avoiding the dispersal of clouds of dust from the floor or from the dressings. So for small wounds, the emphasis is placed on the risk of contact infections and these can be prevented by a good aseptic dressing technique. The principles of an aseptic dressing technique are the same wherever they are carried out whether by a team of nurses working together or by one nurse working alone. Before each dressing, the nurse wipes the table with a disinfectant mop to remove any bacteria that may have fallen onto it, and then dries it. She then cuts the bandages using scissors kept for this purpose in a jar of disinfectant. She removes all but the inner dressing from the wound and discards the soiled material into a deep bin. Her hands may now be contaminated with bacteria from the bandages, so before getting clean material, she washes. This wash is simply to remove any bits of infected dust or fluff that might fall onto clean material. It does not sterilize her hands, but since they never come into contact with the wound, complete sterility is not necessary. Her hands must be dried to prevent any drops of water getting into the wound. She collects the dressing material into a sterile bowl. Two pairs of dressing forceps, dry wool, mops ready moistened with the cleansing solution, and plenty of dry gauze. The clean material is kept in lidded jars so that no dust can fall on it. The treatment and dressing of the wound is carried out with a strict non-touch technique. Notice that with two pairs of forceps, one can be used to steady the patient's finger while the wound treatment is being carried out with the other. The new gauze dressing is put on, covered with another larger piece of gauze, and then the wound is bandaged firmly. Note that the scissors are always kept in disinfectant. The used bowl and forceps are put into the sterilizer for their two minutes boiling and the nurse washes her hands. If during a dressing more material is needed, she must wash her hands before collecting it from the stock table. Where there are large numbers of patients with wounds to be dressed, a specialization of staff and space may be necessary. You will see how this plan works at the Birmingham Accident Hospital. The dressing station consists of an inspection room and three dressing rooms. 
This model shows the general layout. On the left is the inspection room, and on the right, one of the three dressing rooms. The station has been designed to facilitate the flow of patients with a minimum loss of time. Patients come from the waiting hall to the inspection room, which accommodates two patients at a time. One can be seen by the doctor, while the other has his dressing removed. After inspection, the patient goes to one of the dressing rooms for treatment. As a doctor can inspect in one minute a wound that takes six to dress, it's convenient to separate the dressing room from the inspection room. It was found necessary to have more than one dressing room to absorb the flow of patients from the inspection room. As the inspection room accommodates two patients, there is a set of sinks and sterilizers on each side of the room. There's also a wash basin at the back for the doctor. In this way, there's no cross traffic for the supply of sterile materials, and everyone works conveniently near a sink or wash basin. The staff of the room comprises the doctor and his secretary, two nurses whose job it is to expose the wound and later to apply the temporary dressing, and outside the low walls, two servers who keep the dressers supplied with sterile instruments and dressing material. The first patient to come in has a superficial burn of the leg. His foot is placed on a stainless steel rest, designed so that its top can be taken off for sterilizing. Not all the patients who come to the dressing station have to have their wounds inspected at each visit, so the first thing the doctor does when the patient arrives is to glance at his notes and then tell the nurse whether she should remove the dressings. The patient at the far side of the table has now been seen by the doctor and goes to the dressing room for treatment while another patient takes her place. After the nurse has removed the bandages, she follows a careful no-touch technique in removing the inner dressings. All soiled material is placed in a kidney dish, which is immediately emptied into a special bin. The doctor then inspects the wound. Whenever possible, he uses forceps rather than fingers, because if he touches the limb with his fingers, he will have to wash. While the nurse applies a temporary cover to the wound, the doctor dictates notes to his secretary and prescribes treatment. He also makes a note of the treatment on a slip of paper, which he gives to the patient to take to the nurse in the dressing room. As soon as the patient goes out, the nurse takes the limb rest away to be sterilized. Meanwhile, on the other side of the table, the nurse has already started to remove the dressings from the next patient. Notice in the background the two openings between the dressing nurse and the server. Against the side wall is a slab on which the clean material is stored. Below it is the discard bin, and in the centre is the hatch where dirty instruments are passed out to the server. In this case, the doctor has to touch the patient's hand to make an adequate inspection of the wound. Even if he touches the skin some distance from the wound, he must afterwards wash his hands. The nurse is collecting the materials for a temporary wound cover from the sterile stock, 
And while she applies this to the wound, the doctor finishes dictating progress notes to the secretary, taking care not to touch anything with his left hand until he's washed. The nurse returns the soiled instruments to the server and washes and dries her hands. The server cleans the instruments at the sink below the hatch, puts them in the steriliser and then washes her hands. In this way she maintains a flow of clean instruments for the dresser. As before, the doctor writes the patient's treatment on a slip of paper and gives it to the patient to take to the dressing room down the corridor. Before we follow this patient through the dressing room, notice the arrangement of the room as shown in this model. There's space for two patients to be dressed at a time. The staff of each dressing room comprises two dressers, one for each patient, a server who provides the material for both dressers and a runner who is responsible for removing the patient's temporary dressings and for sterilizing instruments and bowls. Near the center of the room is the server's stock table. Immediately behind is the sterilizer with a sink on either side and on each side wall is a wash basin for the dressers to use. There's a curtain separating the two patients' chairs and on each side there is a deep bin for the soiled dressings and a limb rest with a top that can be taken off for sterilizing. The nurse has just finished her dressing and as the patient goes out she washes her hands at the side basin while the runner replaces the contaminated hand rest with a clean one. She washes the soiled rest at the back sink before she puts it in the sterilizer. When the dresser is ready, she beckons the next patient forward to his seat and the runner removes his temporary dressing using scissors kept in disinfectant. The dresser first has to see what treatment the doctor has prescribed. She then goes to the centre table to collect the necessary material from the server. When there's a rapid flow of patients, small quantities of sterile material and lotions may be kept in open bowls on the table without undue risk. But these quantities must be small and should be replaced every 15 to 20 minutes. The dresser now carries out the wound treatment prescribed. Soiled mops are discarded directly into the bin beside the dressing table. Should she require extra material in the middle of a dressing, the server is there to give it to her. Unlike the nurse working alone, the dresser working with the server does not have to wash her hands before collecting it. The treatment completed, the wound is covered with several layers of gauze and a thick pad of wool which helps to keep bacteria from penetrating to the wound from outside. Meanwhile, the runner removes the soiled instruments for sterilizing and the nurse puts on a bandage. The dressing completed, the nurse washes again, 
while the runner cleans and sterilizes the used instruments in readiness for the next patient. As an example of the results observed, we may say that since the institution of this dressing routine, streptococcal cross-infection of small wounds has been reduced to one-fifteenth of what it was previously, from 8.3% to 0.6%.